Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with one of my rare vertical presentations. Why? Because I'm going to have to do a little demo for you. But I'm here to talk about a box set that's been around. I was checking around Amazon and as I do periodically just to see what's in print and what's out of print because most things are out of print and you know the ones that we really want are usually out of print and you know that because when I do these talks and recommend something and it's not available holy crap do I get reamed by you folks and I understand it I understand your frustration it's extremely irritating so one of the things I need to tell you that you can still get is this Leopold Stokowski's Phase 4 Recordings from DECA. 23 CDs of splendid stuff. Now, there are a bunch of Stokowski boxes, which represent only a tiny fraction of what he actually recorded. I mean, he did tons and tons of stuff. What is this? Yes, 23 CDs. Yeah, I was right. And those are, I mean, there's one on, on Warner. There's one on RCA. And there's one on Sony. But this is... Deco one is the best. It's the one you have to get because it's the one that is the most multi-miked, gimmick-prone, Stokowski-ish, unnatural sounding. Oh, it's fabulous. It does all the things that Stokowski did in the studio that he couldn't do in, in real life where things sounded far too natural for him. And so I want to talk you through this because it's absolutely outstanding. And one of the most wonderful and outstanding things about it is its spectacular flamboyant use of the tam-tam, Stokowski's specialty instrument. My oh my, that was something that he always loved to add, whether the composer wrote for it or not. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. So let's go through these 23 CDs and see what we get. This is one of those boxes, by the way, that you cannot pick up from the top. Because if you do, this will happen and it will spill out all over the place. And that's extremely annoying. So, first off, I have to go by the booklet. Because the original jackets don't always tell you what's, what's on the disc, the way they've been compiled for this collection. It begins with a disc wonderful disc actually I have to show you the cover because it's it's just hilarious called inspiration ooh there it is aren't you inspired yeah and as you can see from the thing up there this thing over here it was originally recorded and released by RCA although it was done with DECA phase 4 equipment to make it sound all the more inspirational and this is choruses basically choruses by Beethoven um, yes, you get some Beethoven here. The the heavens, oh my goodness. The heavens are telling, opus 48, number four, which of course is by Haydn as well, but Beethoven did one too. And then traditional Deep River, the Largo from Xerxes by Handel, the Evening Prayer from Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel, some Bach stuff, Rachmaninoff's Vocalese, some more traditional stuff, Please God, from whom, uh, yes, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Yeah, Wagner's Pilgrim's Chorus, Sheep May Safely Graze by Bach, uh, Pater Noster by Tchaikovsky, and Gluck's O Savior Hear Me, that is, the Dance of the Blessed Spirits, rearranged as a church anthem, believe it or not. This is with the Norman Luboff Choir, and Stokowski with the new symphony orchestra, which makes it even more inspirational. So there you have it. That's disc one. Disc two, Scheherazade. Oh my goodness. Oh, this is so much fun. My God, there isn't a natural note in here. And of course, Stokowski added things like xylophone parts and some tam-tam crashes in the finale. And it's just it's just wonderful. Oh my God, it's wonderful. It is the most voluptuous, tasteless, garish recording of Scheherazade you've ever heard in your life, but in a good way. I mean, in a good way, because Stokowski was a genius, and this stuff that he did to these pieces, I mean, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. And then we have pictures at an exhibition in Stokowski's own orchestration, which has 
Ooh, boy, some fantastic, fantastic Tam Tammy moments, including the ending, which gives you a fabulous Tam Tam crescendo. But you're going to have to wait a moment before we do that. And then there's Debussy's The Engulfed Cathedral in Stokowski's own orchestration. These are all with the new Philharmonia. And, oh, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Then we get a couple of Tchaikovsky ballet suites, Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty. Very nice to have. And, you know, Tchaikovsky was always ripe for monkeying. Even the Russians did it. So for Stokowski to do it is nothing special. Oh, and then Vivaldi's The Four Seasons with Hugh Bean on the violin. Now there's a piece that will have the period instrument people shrieking in protest. It's wonderful. I think you should definitely get it just for The Four Seasons and play it for your authentic Baroque friends. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. It's wonderful. Wagner orchestral music from the ring. Oh, this is great. You know, Sikorsky's Wagner was a world unto itself because he even had the nerve to completely rescore Wagner, but they didn't think Wagner was sexy and voluptuous enough for him, believe it or not. So you get the Ride of the Valkyries, Forest Murmurs, the Entry of the Gods into Valhalla, Dawn and Siegfried's Rhine Fart, that is the Rhine Journey, and Siegfried's Death and Funeral Music. And then we get Tchaikovsky's Fifth. Oh, this is bizarre. Now, I, mm, pardon me, I'm, I'm leaning against the uh, cat scratching thing here, the cat post. Tchaikovsky Five. Well, Stokowski does some things to this. He doubles the uh, flute part with a piccolo in the upper octave in the finale so that you can actually hear the wind parts when it's going. Yeah, there's a piccolo there. You know the big pause before the coda in the finale where people like start applauding when they shouldn't because there's like a big pause and the music starts up again? Well, this doesn't have one. <laughs> Stokowski just, just roars right through it so that you don't accidentally think the symphony is coming to an end. And then there's a little nipping and tucking here and there, you know, just for fun. But it's really a beautiful performance, especially the slow movement, which is unbelievably gorgeous. I mean, just incredibly gorgeous. Uh, Handel excerpts from The Messiah with Sheila Armstrong, Norma, Norma Proctor, Kenneth Bowen, John Cameron, the John Aldous Choir, the LSO, and Leopold Stokowski. Well, as you, with the Four Seasons, this is not typical Baroque Handel. It really is. It isn't even Colin Davis's Handel Messiah with the same orchestra. It's Stokowski all the way. Then Mussorgsky's Night on Bald Mountain in Stokowski's own incredibly gaudy orchestration and Tchaikovsky's March Slav and the Firebird Suite, which, which actually you can hear Stokowski's reorchestration of that in Ormandy's recording in mono because Ormandy used those parts. They are famous for, among other things, adding a chime to the infernal dance. It's, you know, da, 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 bang, da, 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 clank. There's a chime, there's a bell there. Stokowski recorded this about a billion times. There's one in the, in the Warner, formerly EMI box too. Lots of fun. Beethoven's Ninth. Holy cow. What can one say? about this Beethoven's Ninth. I'm not even wearing a tie for this one because this is not the Beethoven's Ninth that you wear the tie for. Trust me, it isn't. It's just not, especially at the end, which of course has completely rewritten percussion parts, but even more entertaining is the horns that double the woodwinds on that final, you know, at the very end. He's got the horns doing it. It is the most insane sound you have ever heard in your life. This is not the Beethoven's Ninth for people who wear their tie whenever the Ninth is mentioned. And I'm sorry to disappoint you not to wear the tie, but you know, I could wear I could wear the, the scarf of shame. That's a possibility. Hang on a moment. Hang in there. Hang on. Oh. Here we go. There we go. There. I could wear the, the scarlet scarf of shame for this Beethoven Ninth. It's actually a lot of fun to listen to. It's like everything Stokowski did. No matter how tasteless or vulgar or completely, absolutely horrifying, 
you know, it's it's fun. It's kind of fun, but some people may be a little bit offended, and I kind of understand why. Ah, yes. And then the Symphonie Fantastique. I love this Symphonie Fantastique. It is one of the most, I mean, it's just a, a lush, hallucinogenic, pedal to the metal Symphony Fantastique. I mean, the harps in the second movement, all the effects, and it does have, wait a moment, I have to play the ending. I have to play the ending. Now, you know how it goes. It goes, crash with a suspended symbol. It's a psh, that's it, right? Well, not exactly, because here it goes, you ready? Like that. Mm hmm. Pretty cool, huh? That's pretty nifty. So that is the Symphony Fantastique, and for that, he does not deserve the Scarlet Scarf of Shame because, let's face it, if you, anybody who plays Berlioz even more excessively, and I just dropped the book, who plays Berlioz? even more excessively than Berlioz himself wrote it, deserves as much credit as we can possibly give him. So after that, we get, ah, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet, and the mussorgsky Borsgudinov Symphonic Synthesis by Tchaikovsky, which uses all kinds of gongs and bells and things and stuff. He sort of invented these, these percussive interludes between the actual sections of the opera. It's a wonderful piece. People should play it. It should be a repertory piece. It really should. It's just terrific. Um, th and that's with the Orchestre de la Suisse Romande. But the thing with Stokowski, as you know, is that it doesn't make any difference what orchestra he used it. He was using because within five seconds, they all sounded like Stokowski. It was incredible. I mean, if you've ever heard his recordings, the ones on, on in the Warner Box with the Leipzig Gavant House Orchestra, and you think, oh, God, it's hopeless. But no. He did that Firebird with the Combined House. It sounds absolutely like Stokowski in Philly. It was his sound, and he could get it like that. It was amazing. That's why he was a great conductor. Okay, the 1812 Overture, you know, the one with, like, everybody. It's got bands and, and all kinds of stuff in it, and the Palofzian dances. That also has some nipping and tucking and extra stuff at the very end and the Stravinsky Pastoral, Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> um, not as bizarre as the Ninth, but it's, it's, it's kind of close. Some of people might find it a little stodgy, actually. Um, and it's, it's, it is, <laughs> I mean, frankly, it is. Schubert's Unfinished. This is actually quite yummy, with a very slow andante. I mean, it really is. but. It's, it's very mysterious and beautiful. I, I like it. Oh, my. Disc 15. Oh, this is so much fun. You've got La Mer. Now, I have to play the end of La Mer. Wait a second. So, you know how the La Mer ends. It's da-da-da-da, smash. With a tam-tam, crash. You know, da-da-da-da, boom, crash. Dum with a timpani. A very hard, sec, final timpani whack. Well... What Stokowski does is impose a huge retard on that last chord, and then where the horns are doing their the cymbal roll is going, just before the tippity go, whack! Stokowski does this. Da whack! <laughs> That's what it does. And it's just amazing. You'll notice I used my my hang. I use this one because it has such a responsive sound quality to it. You don't have to hit it very hard to get an enormous crescendo and a smooth crescendo, which is sometimes very difficult on some of these other tam-tams that are bulky and they take too long to, to actually resonate, to speak, as they say in the biz. But this one, no problem. You just give it a little whack and off it goes. So. And then you get the Daphnis and Chloe Suite Number no. Two. Now, the Daphnis and Chloe Suite Number no. Two ends with the wordless chorus. You may recall going orgasmically moaning because they're having an orgy. Whoa! Bum bum bum! Whoa! Bum bum bum! You know. And then at the end, they have this last 
Whoa! Thump. Well, <laughs> not exactly, because here, here they go, whoa! Thump. And then they come back and they go, ha! Chunk. There isn't a tam tam crescendo. <laughs> But he doesn't need it. He's got the choir to do the same thing. And then there's the Ballet of the Sylphs from the Damnation of Faust and a fabulous Charles Ives orchestral set number two. Absolutely amazing. And the best ever performance still of Messiaen's L'Ascension. Oh yeah, because L'Ascension has an entire movement meant to be played with extra vibrato. And Messiaen marks it. And boy, does Stokowski do it. Oh, it's gorgeous. That Ives and Messiaen stuff is so typical of how Stokowski could be completely demented in the standard classics, but then you give him some modern novelty and he played it with more faithfulness and attention to detail and scrupulousness and beauty than anyone in the entire universe ever has. It's true of the Ives, it's true of the Messiaen, it's true of his Frank Martin Petit Symphony Concertant, all of those pieces. When he did modern stuff, he was in comparable because he played it like it was the greatest music in the world. And that's the key. It's the key to all this stuff. Didn't matter what it was, you played it like it was the greatest music in the world. Fantastic. Okay, next, Ravel, uh, the fanfare from Leventai de Jean, you know, Jean's fan. And then the Franck D minor, ooh, with the Hilversum Radio Symphony, a very, very perverse performance of the Franck all over the place, tempo-wise. And if you think Franck is, you know, hair-raisingly vulgar and trashy, well, baby, this performance is for you. Then there's his anniversary concert. This was like a two-disc set at one point. You get the the uh, Meistersinger Prelude, the Debussy Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, Glazunov's Violin Concerto, which is gorgeous, of course, with Silvia Markovici. This is with the London Symphony. And then Brahms' first symphony. Yes. Now, Stokowski and Brahms is a whole other world. Naturally, he blew the third. His third was always terrible. Um, nowhere more so than in his Houston symphony recording on Everest, which got my vote for worst ever Brahms third in the history of humanity. But all the others he did very well. And he didn't tinker too much. Yes, he redid some timidity parts and maybe a few brass things here and there. But basically... He plays it more or less the way Brahms wrote it. And I mean, he was a contemporary of Brahms. He knew the style from a certain excessively romantic angle. And it's wonderful to hear Brahms done with completely uninhibited, sensuous beauty. Because nowadays, you know, people treat Brahms like, like castor oil. You know, it's supposed to be good for you. It's not supposed to be attractive or fun. But Stokowski was both, and that's really nice. Then there's another March Slav, and Stokowski's orchestration of the Chopin Mazurka in A minor, and Franz Schubert's Moment Musical, and Stokowski's, these are all his little versions. William Byrd's Pavan, the Earl of Salisbury, which you can bet is not performed the way Byrd wrote it. And Tchaikovsky's a uh, song without words in A minor, Jeremiah Clark's Trumpet Voluntary, Duparc's Extase. I mean, Stokowski was the king of Extase. Absolutely. And the Rachmaninoff Prelude in C sharp minor. Oh, that's so juicy and dark. Then we get the Enigma Variations. This is with a Czech fill. This is famous. We talked about this in my video on the Elgar Enigma Variations, and it's quite splendid. And we have, let's see, oh, the Bach Orchestral Transcriptions disc with the Czech fill, which is regarded by many as the best Bach Orchestral Transcription recording that Stokowski ever made. It's absolutely fabulous. And finally, also with the Czech fill, the Poem of Ecstasy. Ah, the Poem d'Extase, which Stokowski recorded about every 15 minutes. He did more of them than anyone ever in the history of humanity. And it was obviously one of his specialties for its sensuality and its orgasmic qualities. And actually, the lean sonority of the Czech Philharmonic works really, really well here because you get that sensuality, but but there's also a little bit of transparency to the texture and that wonderful vibrato to the solo trumpet when it's going wonderful. 
Then the, the Rimsky Korsakov Capriccio Espanol. Are you drooling yet? I mean, you should just have saliva dripping from you at this point. I mean, this is all just great vintage Stokowski stuff. The kind of thing you've just got to have in your collection. And a Dvorak Slavonic Dance, Opus 72, number two, just to have it there. And then we're already up to CD 22. Oh, this is a very bizarre Beethoven seventh, shorn of all of its repeats. Yes, all of them, all of them, <laughs> even some of the ones that Beethoven probably, probably intended must absolutely be played. No, no, no. The scherzo only takes five minutes and 26 seconds. That is not good, folks. Not good at all. And the Egmont Overture, which is a little bit more normal, thank God. And then there's a bonus CD. And the bonus CD is just some sort of like, you know, speech thing. Previously unreleased recordings other than the extracts of something with something in the LSO. And they are, let's see. Stokowski, a memoir, introduction, background, and overview, review, the Stokowski sound with, you know, these interviews, it's basically interviews, right? Rehearsals, which is kind of cool, his effect on musicians, which ranged from inspiration to deathly paralysis, apparently, um, public personality and public person persona. I have to tell you a story. I'll tell you a Stokowski story about that. Approach to interpretation, conclusion, summary of his achievement, and then Stokowski remembers Gustav Mahler in conversation. He talks about Mahler, half of which you think he made up, actually. It wasn't even real, but the truth never, never concerned Stokowski. And then Thomas Martin recalls auditioning for Stokowski. And that's what's on disc 23 now for this story. You may recall, Stokowski at one point was married to Gloria Vanderbilt and he was about, you know, 187 and she was like 25 at the time that they were married. And Stokowski, you remember, I mean, Stokowski had the hair down to here and he was he kind of was, you know, a little strange looking, you know, especially when he wasn't all dressed and ready to perform. So one day, one day, uh, one of Gloria's society women uh, came to meet her to take her to, you know, the the bridge club or the whatever it was where they did whatever they did, those wealthy New York women. This was before Gloria Vanderbilt, you know, did jeans and became a fashion icon. She was just Stokowski's much younger wife for reasons we don't really know. So anyway, Stokowski opened the door and he was, it was in the morning and he had on like a tatty bathrobe and his hair was like down to here and he's, you know, and he had his weird accent. He said, hey, she's, she's, she'll go get her, please come and have a seat in the, in the lounge or whatever you do. And so Gloria comes down and says, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I was getting ready. Sorry to keep you waiting. And the society matron turns to Gloria and said, oh, my dear, it's no problem. I've been having such a lovely conversation with your grandmother. That is how I remember Leopold Stokowski. And, you know, as a person, as a musician, we have this. The phase four recordings. It's still around. Get it while you can. Please get it while you can. Thank you for listening. Keep on listening, folks. I hope you enjoyed this vertical presentation with percussive excerpts. Take care.